Got it. All right, I'll let you go. Okay, all right. Hello, whoever's here. Thank you for listening to my talk. So this talk is um, about uh, me as a GP. I am, just to introduce myself, I'm a GP in Melbourne in the suburb of Wonturner. I've been a GP for about 15 years. I finished in, uh, I did university in Melbourne Uni in the year 2000. And uh, I worked in Box Hill Hospital. Then I went to GP, did 15 years, and I suddenly had an interest and uh, um, about nutrition. So I'm just going to go through my journey on how I developed this interest and uh, what's my, how my practice has changed. So this is um, a few photos of me. That's me in the clinic and my family. I've got two boys. They are 13 and 10. As a side hobby, I go running a lot and I actually run marathons. I ran a marathon in 2019 and I ran another marathon last year in December. And you can see I ran two bays, which is um, a 28 kilometer trail run. Uh, it took me about four hours, but it was good fun. So that's just a bit of information about me. I have two dogs as well. They're Odyssey and Ridgebacks. So what happens was um, about five years ago, I finished, I mean, I haven't finished, but the kids grew a bit older and I decided to work on myself and I wanted to get fit and join the gym. So that's me uh, trying to work out on the gym and try to lose some fat. So I joined an eight-week body transformation program. The trainer told me I had to limit my carbohydrates, eat plenty of protein. I had to weigh my food, put them on the scale. You can see the table that my trainer told me to. I needed to eat 130 gram of protein. So I had to put it on a scale and 30 gram of fat and no carbs for the lunch and so on. So I learned how to eat that way. And basically that's a low carbohydrate diet. So I just followed the uh, the trainer of what um, he told me to do and I ended up losing about four kilos and that's about four percent body fat and pretty happy so that's how I started to eat this way so I looked into the science lockdown came along in 2020 and I started to read more books and these books have opened up a whole new world of history of nutrition and how the nutrition science came along. Um, so if you have a look at these books, you can get it from Audible, which is audio books, and you can um, have a read of the background of how nutrition came about. There's actually um, lots of stories on the low fat movement is actually not much science to it. And the real, what really uh, is the background of this low fat movement is because of a few scientists that's got big ego and uh, they have big personalities and push the government into going into the food pyramid, promoting low fat diet and rather than low carb diet. So I got into a few websites and a few courses. Um, so these websites are highly recommended. You can go and have a look. Nutrition Network is a South African website that does a lot of low carb nutrition. You can see Tim Noakes, who is a professor of low carb nutrition. He was, um, had getting, got into trouble against the law in the, uh, South Africa because he suggested to a lactating woman to feed the baby low carb and he fought and he went through a court case and um, he won so the South African government gave him all the winning for promoting low carb nutrition so pretty fascinating but nutrition network does a lot of education for 
even for the lay people, for nutritionists, for dietitians, and for healthcare practitioners, it's highly recommended. Um, Diet Doctor can be a layman website, and there's lots of um, courses for healthcare professionals as well. Very, very self-explanatory. It is free. You can also join. I have become Diet Doctor Pro, and I got into touch with Dr. Brett Sher, who does good podcasts, and you can have a look at Dr. Brett Sher's podcast, listening to lots of information about nutrition. Low Carb Down Under is an Australian um, low carb website, low carb movement. They might do a uh, conference later in the year. So that might be interesting to go along. Could be in Gold Coast, could maybe in October. They didn't do it in the last two years because of COVID, but in 2019, they had a conference in Gold Coast. So that might be interesting for new, uh, students or doctors, and I'm thinking of going as well. Currently, I'm doing ACNAM. So ACNAM is Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. So um, doing a few modules, they're all online, hoping to be set up to be a fellow of ACNAM. And then there's Australian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which is very, very good as well, but uh, I've chosen ACNAM over the ASLM. So those are the websites you might wanna just have a look and um, there might be some information here and there and uh, just have a look. So through Facebook, I've connected with lots of people. Um, just in the middle, Low Carb Melbourne is the Facebook group that I've set up with a few health coaches. It's a support group for Melbourne people. There's about a thousand people who have joined our Facebook group. So it's um, giving education, support, and people can just post it. It is layman, layman's term. Then there's low carb Melbourne, and then there's low carb doctors and um, keto support. So lots of Facebook group with lots of information on how to practice low carb medicine. So you're most welcome to join our low carb Melbourne group, which is uh, very friendly, very supportive, and you don't have to be practicing low carb. It might be interesting just to see what people are doing, what people eat. Most people are enjoying what they're eating. So I just want to go through a few, over the many years, the few myths that I used to tell my patients. So just bear in mind that I've been a GP since year 2003, and I've only learned about nutrition in the last about two or three years. So the majority of my GP life, I've been practicing traditional low-fat um, medicine. So, so I'm just gonna reflect on the myths that I used to tell my patient. And um, it might give you a bit few insight on what other doctors are saying and how I have changed my view over the last two years. So the first myth that I used to tell my patient is how to lose weight is to diet and exercise. So mm -hmm. calorie counting. So calorie in, calorie out, and you have to, have more calorie out than calorie in. So what I've learned in the last couple of years is it, it's actually not true. You can't count calories and there's a lot more to it than calorie in, calorie out. There's a lot more to do with hormones. There's a lot more to do with metabolism and uh, your this basal metabolic rate, even if you, count if you do lots of exercise if you eat a bad diet with lots of of um, high carbohydrate and um, refined foods you're probably not gonna be losing weight because you're gonna affect your hormone raise your insulin and that just isn't gonna work so whoever tells you to eat less and exercise more to lose weight you can tell them it's not as simple as that. What I, the second myth I used to tell my patients is high fat food is unhealthy. So back in the epidemiological studies, people used to compare fatty food and so high fat diet and low fat diet. 
So they compared a high fat diet, looking at the picture on the above with hamburgers and pizzas, there with the low fat diet. So the low fat diet being whole foods. So looking at these two pictures, the high fat diet up the top and the high fat diet down the bottom, the high fat down diet down the bottom with coconut oil, fish and butter and olive oil. That's actually a very, very healthy high fat diet. And those healthy fat is actually very essential for you and isn't gonna raise your insulin. It's actually very, very beneficial for helping you lose weight and be healthy. So you've got to be careful with the epidemiological studies that compares what food with what food. The third myth that I used to tell my patient is breakfast is the most important part of the day and you need to keep eating eat every two hours to stimulate your metabolism. That's actually not quite true. So what happens if you keep adding eating every two hours is you're gonna keep stimulating your insulin. So insulin is the hormone that is responsible for storing your glucose to become fat. So if you keep raising insulin, keep moving your glucose to fat. So you're gonna keep storing your fat and keep building up fat. So what you should really should be doing is letting your insulin rest. And if you have a break between breakfast and your lunch and not have a snack in between, then your insulin can go down and start to burn a bit of fat. And if you have time restricted eating and have at least 12 hours not eating, let's say between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. you don't eat, then your insulin level can actually go down and you can start burning a bit of fat and let your body have a bit of a rest. So eventually you can reduce the chance of insulin resistance. Your insulin can work a bit better and um, you can uh, start burning fat. So you don't have to eat breakfast. A lot of low carb people actually don't eat breakfast and have two meals a day. Um, they can have lunch at 12 and then have dinner at seven and then don't eat any other meals, no snacks. That's actually very, very beneficial to reduce insulin and reduce your chance of insulin resistance and even reduce di uh, reverse diabetes. Um, so breakfast is the most important part of the day. That saying is actually promoted by Kellogg's the cereal company because they want to sell this the breakfast cereal so just be careful of promoting um, eating every two hours to increase your metabolism there's actually not much science to it the fourth myth that I used to tell my patients is you have to be careful with salt and because that can reduce so salt can cause blood pressure cause hypertension um, there's actually not much science to it. And the studies that has done to test salt is actually very flawed. What really can make blood pressure hypertension worse? It's actually the other white grain, which is sugar. So, and processed foods. So what I've actually found is telling patients to reduce sugar, reduce processed food, re reduce carbohydrates, reduce insulin resistance, actually is beneficial to reduce their blood pressure and the hypertension can actually way improve. And I would actually try that before giving them a blood pressure tablet. I think that's beneficial and people will appreciate more of promoting lifestyle advice over um, a tablet. The fifth myth that I usually tell my patient is avoid meat, avoid red meat, especially because it can increase your risk of cancer. Again, the science to it isn't very, isn't very sound. So they've compared the top picture with a vegan eating salads who are very, very health conscious and they go to checkups and they do lots of exercise and maybe do yoga. And they compare these people, the cancer risk, 
with the bottom picture with a uh, overweight man eating lots of meat as well as hamburgers as well as soft drinks and guess who's got the higher cancer risk of course the man <laughs> down the bottom can have a higher cancer risk because of maybe the hamburgers and the soft drinks and the not exercise and the not having checkups rather than the healthy vegan lady. So the WHO, they compare the risk of red meat with cancer is actually very, very a tiny bit higher. So there's really not much science to telling people that meat increases the risk of cancer. The next myth I used to tell my patients is vegetable oils are healthy. So you have to be very careful with vegetable oils. They are actually trans fat and very inflammatory and actually can increase your risk of insulin resistance and they're very, uh, um, they're like petroleum. So vegetable oil, which includes canola oil, sunflower oil, even margarine is uh, very, very inflammatory and people should go back to butter, olive oil, and uh, even coconut oil. Another myth that I used to tell my patient is uh, eat two serves of fruit and, and five serves of vegetables a day. Again, there's not much science to it. Um, the, they just pull the number, five, veg five serves of vegetables out of nowhere because they think vegetables is healthy. And um, if you look into, uh, there's a lady called Zoe Harcomb and uh, she has done lots of research on the studies and there's actually no real study comparing the number of serves of fruit and veggies that you need to be healthy. I've actually met a lot of friends that are actually carnivores. They only meet, eat meat and animal products and cheese and eggs. They are extremely healthy, they don't, suffer constipation and um, they have tremendous health, very good metabolism and uh, they don't have any bowel trouble. Another myth I used to tell my patients, keto is dangerous. You still need carbs and low carb isn't sustain sustainable. Um, I have lots of friends that is maintaining on keto and they eat low carb and they actually have very good health. I myself have been low carb for a number of years and I don't really want to eat processed foods and sugar and uh, bread, potatoes, pasta anymore. And you feel tremendous. I don't really see how eating low carb can be unsustainable. In fact, eating low carb can help with lots and lots of metabolic conditions. You can certainly reverse diabetes, which I have a few case studies coming up. Metabolic syndrome is signs of pre-diabetes and uh, metabolic syndrome can certainly be reversed. Obesity, hypertension, we've mentioned before. Fatty liver is a form of metabolic syndrome. Quite often fatty liver is because of they might be drinking fruit juice, soft drinks, too much sugar, maybe eating too much fruit. If, they, if you see abnormal liver function tests, the, the most often cause is fatty liver if they don't drink much alcohol. So that can easily be reversed with uh, a low carb diet and it can work within up to a week. So very magic. Gastroesophageal reflux certainly can be helped with low carb. Gout is another metabolic sin, uh, disease. Epilepsy has long, long history of people using low carb keto, actually just keto, not low carb, of controlling epilepsy. Migraines can be helped. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. I have a case of case study that I can present with you about a lady with PCOS and uh, she ended up having a baby, tremendous result. There's some skin conditions, acne, eczema, psoriasis actually can certainly be helped with eating low carb. Down the bottom, Alzheimer's disease is now being described as type three diabetes. It's actually the brain not accessing the nutrients. If you switch the, the fuel from glucose to ketones, the brain can actually metabolize ketones and Alzheimer's disease, dementia can certainly be 
helped and uh, symptoms often can be reversed. Parkinson's disease, ADHD, autism, lots of mental health conditions, some cancers. Now cancer is fed by glucose. So if someone has cancer, I think we, we need to tell and warn the patient that they need to limit their glucose. Certainly you need to go through the chemo, that you need to have surgery. If it's a breast cancer, you need to cut out the cancer, but um, breast cancer can quite often be linked to glucose metabolism, metabolic conditions. And if you stop feeding the cancer with glucose, that can starve the cancer, but you can't just tell them, this is the treatment. You've, you've got to go through all the tra traditional oncologies and uh, surgeons. Chronic pain disorders. There's a new study showing that chronic pain can certainly be improved with low carb keto and the pain scores can certainly be improved at all, all together. Fibromyalgia, um, I've had a lady with chronic fatigue syndrome and she just had one phone call with me and um, I talked to her about the diet. It's only a 30 minute phone call. She lives in the country, Victoria. I talked to her about low carb and I told her about what food to eat, what food not to eat. Uh, only two weeks ago, I emailed her again. She has tremendously improved her chronic fatigue syndrome. So chronic fatigue syndrome and long COVID has lots of associations. Maybe long COVID can be improved with eating low carb through reducing inflammatory mechanisms. So um, there could be lots of studies coming up with um, about chronic fatigue and long COVID. So we've learned that metabolic syndrome has, um, is the majority of the causes of chronic conditions nowadays. So you see these people with fatty liver, they often have sleep apnea, they snore and then they can't sleep properly and then they get even more grumpy because they can't sleep and then they keep eating sugar, their insulin resistance get worse, it's a vicious cycle. Then their blood pressure get up because they, sleep, they have sleep apnea, they eat more sugar, quite often their kidney function gets worse, the BMI is over 30 with central obesity, inflammatory markers go up. So I actually routinely check inflammatory marker CRP in the last couple of years. And it's amazing how you find people with diabetes can have high inflammatory markers. Anything over five with CRP, or actually it says over three, is associated with high inflammation, quite often with metabolic syndrome. Gout is often associated with metabolic syndrome. And you can quite often you can see the gout with overweight. Sometimes it's uh, described as too much excess calories all of a sudden. So it could be because they drank too much alcohol all of a sudden, could be a sudden, very calorie rich meal that they went to the restaurant. The lipids profile. So typically with metabolic syndrome, you have high triglyceride. So if you see a triglyceride more than 1.7, you can guess that they're probably eating too much carbohydrates. HDL, if their good cholesterol is less than one, then it's probably part of metabolic syndrome. LDL doesn't really correlate that well. And the total cholesterol I've learned that isn't actually that much correlation, which I will actually come back to later in the presentation. So this is metabolic syndrome. You can see them walking around the street with elevated waist circumference. They've got a pot belly. You have to be careful with some population, Asians and Indian actually, don't have to be very overweight. They don't have to be have big waist circumference and they can be tofi. So tofi means thin on the outside, fat on the inside, and then they still have metabolic syndrome. So be careful with those um, ethnic groups. So with metabolic syndrome, you've got to satisfy three out of five and you've got metabolic syndrome. They've got high triglyceride, higher than 1.7, even higher than one is pretty bad. A low HDL, lower than one in men, lower than 1.3 in women, high blood pressure, higher than 130 on 85, 
and the high fasting glucose, higher than 5.5. So you only have three out of five and you've got a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. If you have metabolic syndrome, you, these people most likely has insulin resistance. If you tell them to reduce their carbohydrate intake, reduce their stress, improve sleep, quite often they can actually reverse this metabolic syndrome and even reduce chances of diabetes. So I've got a few case studies to present for you of patients that I have encountered over the last couple of years. This is a lady, she's uh, 33. She's got a very high BMI of 46, very overweight, 126 kilo kilogram. She has an 11 year old daughter. Uh, she probably has polycystic ovarian syndrome. Her period's all over the place. Uh, signs of fatty liver, abnormal liver function tests. She used to come in with recurrent abscesses and cellulitis and come in for antibiotics. She went through IVF because she wanted another baby and it's all failed. She then suddenly saw my picture on the wall of this bowl of chicken salad with no carbs in it. Oh, the corn is a little bit of carb, but um, no rice, no bread, no grains, no quinoa. And she decided that that is what she's gonna change. She's gonna try a low carb diet. Um, she started drinking apple cider vinegar. She uh, ate good carbs or a little bit of um, healthy carbs and uh, eat more meat. And she lost only 10 kilos and she fell pregnant after 11 years. So that is amazing story and uh, she now is the baby. So reversing polycystic ovarian syndrome can be achievable with a low carb diet and you get a baby in the end, which is very, very rewarding. The second case is um, Chris, he's a, he's a 57 year old man. He's a um, quite wealthy, he, is, he does work on uh, a he was a high functioning corporate guy. He's a psychologist. He had weight gain, lockdown. Because of lockdown, he was depressed and then he ate all the foods and drank all the alcohol because he got bored and um, nobody could control him. He was stuck at home. He contacted a health coach. The health coach contacted me and we've started to do low carb and he started intermittent fasting. So initially he's on blood pressure tablet, he's on Evapro HCT, he's got anxiety, so he takes our president a couple of times a day. He's on femfibrobate because of high cholesterol and etrovastatin. So these are his bloods. So I, I knew him from April last year and I saw him again July in this um, blood test three months apart. You can see he's uh, blood pressure tablets are still the same, but I got rid of his cholesterol tablets because he really didn't need it. Um, his weight has reduced from 125 kilogram to 114 kilos. His BMI has gone down from 42 to 38. His HbA1c has gone from 6.5 to 5.9, so fantastically reduced and reversed his diabetes. His triglyceride has come down from 2.6 to 1.7. Even though his total cholesterol has come up, it's probably because he's stopped all his cholesterol tablet, but I am happy that because his triglyceride has come down, his HDL has come up a bit, that, um, and his fasting insulin has come down, he is actually managing much, much better. So he's still got to sustain and maintain this low carb lifestyle, otherwise he will become a worse diabetic with worsening risks of complications. I did a calcium artery score on him. He scored 96.8, which is mortality, which is um, come back as mortality risk less than 10% in the last, in the, in the next 10 years of having a heart attack. We've decided that because he, this is second, this is sorry, primary prevention. He's never had a heart attack before then it is really not worth having a statin and the gemfibrobrate. So we got rid of the statin and cholesterol tablet 
and um, we're very happy that he's um, reduced his risk of complications. So I've got case number three. He's quite a typical old man. He's a 75 year old Gary. He's, I've just told him he had diabetes. He had some Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate cancer. He was on sertraline at 12 statin. I told him he's got diabetes, that he has to adopt a low carb, high fat lifestyle. He stocked his biscuits and snacks and ate a bit of low carb bread. And um, he said he's very happy and started a bit more gardening. And over, so that's February, 2021 is the last column. You can see his HbA1c has come right down from 10 to 5.8 to 5.7, no medications. Um, his triglyceride has come right down. His HDL has increased. If it gets that up to over one, that's even better. His liver function has reduced. It's probably him reversing his fatty liver. And his fasting glucose has come down from 12.4 to 5.4. So fantastic result and you can reverse these people with diabetes and it's very, very rewarding. So diabetes remission is divine, defined as partial remission is two or more consecutive HbA1c in sub-diabetic range of 5.7 to 6.4 for at least 12 months without medication. So those case studies doesn't really satisfy the remission quite yet. So we've got to still monitor and still encourage them a healthy low carb lifestyle. Um, so we've got to still keep monitoring, keep checking the eyes, the feet and monitor for complications, heart attacks, strokes. Uh, so that's partial remission. Complete remission is two or more HbA1c levels less than 5.7 for at least 12 months. So um, we'll monitor, monitor these people a bit longer. Maybe they can achieve the complete remission. Prolonged remission is the above for at least five years. So I think we can achieve it, but um, we've just got to be vigilant and encouraging and keep promoting the lifestyle rather than the standard low fat diet that the food pyramid is promoting. So what happened, what about the cholesterol? Quite often with a low carb lifestyle, people's cholesterol actually increase. So people get worried, their doctor gets worried about the cholesterol and uh, they tell them to stop this keto diet, stop this nonsense, keto is dangerous, stop the low carb because the LDL is increasing and the cholesterol is increasing, everyone panics because the usual doctor is, thinks the cholesterol blocks the arteries and the LDL is the black, bad cholesterol, it actually blocks, I mean, it doesn't actually, but they worry that the LDL, high LDL is associated with increased cardiovascular risk. So what actually happens is there's, let me go back to the previous figure, there's, the, you can see the LDL, so you can see the LDL type one and type two is actually quite big and fluffy and they're actually pretty good LDLs. And when the LDL hangs around longer, they go from the LDL type three to the smaller LDL type four, five, six, seven. And this is caused by oxidation and stress, sugar, glucose, lack of sleep, uh, environmental toxins, and uh, it actually makes the big fluffy good type of LDLs to small dense LDLs. So what we really should be measuring is what the LDL subfraction is to get a better understanding of what sort of LDLs you have and rather than demonize all type of LDLs as bad cholesterol. So there's actually good types of LDLs called LDL type one and two, and the small dense LDL is actually the worst ones, which really is associated with cardiovascular risk. So there are some labs, not the traditional labs, not Dorovich or, or, or um, uh, the traditional uh, 
pathology companies, they actually do the LDL subtraction. So I actually order LDL subtraction. This is what I only have done in the last two years. Um, I sent it to a special pathology company called NutriPath. Um, so they come up with uh, LDL type one, type two, and the small density LDLs. So when you have a normal type A profile on the left, the predominant LDLs with the, uh, you can see on the yellow LDL subtraction one and two, they are, it says there, they are large buoyant LDLs and they're actually good healthy LDLs. So if you have a predominant type one, type two LDL, it's actually, even if you have high LDLs, it's actually really not to worry. But if you have an abnormal non-type A profile on the right here, you have predominant the red bits, the small dense LDL type three, four, five, six, seven, and not the predominant type one, type two, then that's actually lots of small dense LDL and that is associated with cardiovascular risk. So this is a, the next diet case study. This is actually myself. So 46 and I'm a runner, very athletic. I go to the gym twice a week. I run four times a week. And I've had a low carb lifestyle for four or five years. I do have a family history of type two diabetes. My mom has type two diabetes, but I am very skinny BMI of 21. So I plotted my cholesterol and HbA1c. My HbA1c has an, it's went from 5.4 to 5.7, 5.6 as I got older. The last column is uh, 2021. So you can actually, uh, that's what I tested myself last year. So my cholesterol has increased from 4.8 before my low carb lifestyle up to 6.3 when I just started my low carb lifestyle. Now, last year, my cholesterol has gone up to 9.3. So the doctor, actually the boss who ordered my cholesterol profile actually came to my room and said, Aidy, your cholesterol is so high, you better do something about it. So that is very frightening for the normal doctor. And he can see my LDL has gone up to 6.2. So the normal doctor would be terrified that I would have blocked arteries. Um, but really looking at the triglyceride, it's gone from 0.9 to 0.7 to a very, very low number of 0.5. So I'm actually very, very happy that my triglyceride is terribly low and fantastic. My good cholesterol has gone up from 1.4 to 2.6 and to a tremendous level of 2.9. So it's actually gone a very good direction. So this is my LDL subfraction study. So you can see my cholesterol is 9.2, very high, but you can see that um, down the middle, the LDL 1, 2, three, four is predominantly what I have. The LDL type one is the highest and type two, a little bit of type three and four, which if I can get rid of those will be even better, but I don't have any type five, six and seven. So the lab has deemed me as a type A normal profile. So that's actually a very favorable um, LDL subfraction even though my total cholesterol is terribly high and my LDL level is very high, I'm really not worried that my LDL will clot my arteries. In fact, I did actually see, have a look at my arteries because I just wanted to have a baseline and I wanted to go through the test. So I ordered myself a calcium artery, sorry, coronary artery calcium score. So a coronary a CAG score, you can actually uh, get it done at a radiology place. It feels like a CT that's not invasive. It is not Medicare bulk billing. Or the, the LDL subfraction isn't Medicare bulk billing. Uh, me there's no Medicare rebate either. So it does cost about $180 for the patient to pay. 
And this CAC score also cost the patient about $180 to pay. So I ordered it at Knox Private Hospital. I lie down in the CT scanner, non-invasive, not a, um, uh, it's not an uh, angiogram. There's no dyes, just lie there for a CT scan. And this is my result. 45 year old female with high cholesterol for further risk of stratification. My calcium score has been perfect at zero. So it's a very, very low risk and of cardiovascular risk. So virtually the radiologist couldn't see any calcium deposits in my arteries. So I am planning to repeat this in five years time. Hope, and um, I don't think this high cholesterol of mine will cause any calcium deposits because predominantly I am LDL type one, type two, big fluffy LDLs. So the benefit of low carb, this is what I gathered from low carb Melbourne Facebook support group. The, the members have told me these are the side effects of low carb diet. You lose weight as a side effect, which most people are very, very happy with. You actually don't feel hungry if you eat enough protein. You feel this, the feeling of satiety, stop feeling hungry. A lot of people will stop feeling brain fog. They're not tired, they have more energy, they sleep better, the metabolic, metabolic health are better, improve memory, they're not as bloated. Blood pressure comes down, improve your reflux, Control of type 1, type 2, even type 1 diabetes. If you control your carbs, you need less insulin. Your glucose level will be more stable. I've had lots of discussion with type 1 diabetics. A lot of them don't believe me and they want to believe their endocrinologist. They still want to eat their sugar and count the insulin, which is fine. But I actually think the better way is to eat, don't eat the carbs and you let, can less, need less medication. And you can actually improve in endurance. And I actually ran my marathon without eating much carbs and I don't train with carb loading. You improve your mood because glucose can actually cause depression, anxiety, and makes things worse. Improving immunity can certainly help. I actually routinely tell my COVID patients to don't eat sugar and avoid white carbohydrates and that might help them improve COVID and get them better from long COVID. These people are what influence me and social media is what is um, made me learn about low carb. I will email you this list of, of all my slides and you can go through these people with, they have lots of information. They post updates on Insta, they have YouTubes, um, Tracy McBeef has a low carb lifestyle hub. She's a uh, health coach. She helped me set up low carb Melbourne. Real life medicine has two low carb GPs. And um, if you look up um, Paul Mason, he has lots of YouTube videos on explaining the cholesterol. Actually took me a few goes on watching his videos on YouTube to actually understand what um, the cholesterol is because I actually had to unlearn all the years of telling people about cholesterol because I used to tell them I, about that I want your cholesterol to be less than 5.5 and I looked at the LDLs so I have to unlearn all the years and years of practicing warning patients on cholesterol so Paul Mason is the person to look at on YouTube Tim Noakes set up um, nutrition network and uh, Brett Sure is diet doctor podcast is lots of information David Unwin is the GP in UK who reversed lots and lots of diabetes he's my hero he used to not like becoming being a GP but now that he's promoting low cup he's reversed lots and lots of diabetes and he's actually loving his job and telling everybody about it these are the books that inspired me. Um, the first one is my first book that I read, A Fat Lot of Good by Peter Bruckner. So Peter Bruckner is uh, very inspiring. He's an Australian doctor for the Australian Cricket Club many years ago. 
So he's, a, he's set up an app called Defeat Diabetes recently, just in during lockdown. Um, I'm actually meeting him up for uh, lunch next week because I've suggested he really should um, let GPs have free access to the Defeat Diabetes app so GPs can learn about reversing diabetes and low carb eating. So we're in the process of doing that and I will let you know how I go. Um, there's all these other books you can have a read and which has inspired me lots. So now that I'm doing ACNAM learning, Australian College of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine, I've learned that with consultation, if you focus on these six things, you can reverse 80% of chronic conditions. And patients actually appreciate you to talk about these rather than giving them a blood pressure tablet or cholesterol tablet or diabetes tablet. So I'm actually starting to talk about these in turn in my, new, in my consultations. So in conclusion, reversing diabetes, very, very rewarding. So uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, you get a baby and it's very rewarding as well. You can change views one patient at a time. Sugar could be the next tobacco. So hopefully 10 years down the track, we know sugar is bad for you just like we know cigarettes are bad for you right now. So with, I'm trying to spread the word to other doctors and GPs, and there's lots and lots of resistance because everyone is taught the old way. A lot of doctors don't wanna change and they still wanna do low fat rather than low carb. The Australian Dietary Guidelines is still talking about low fat and you need to eat lots of grains. But from what I have learned as a GP is don't stop learning. What you've been taught now, it could well be wrong. When you become a doctor five years down the track, what you've learned now, 50% could be wrong. So you've got to unlearn and learn new things. So I am learning lots of new things and it's very inspiring. And uh, you should always look into it and uh, do the research yourself. So these are my social medias. You're most welcome to follow me. You can join the Cut Melbourne and um, learn about the stories. So I will forward these slides to Tom and uh, you're most welcome to look up all the resources. I can welcome questions. Hi, Dr. Charlton. Hi. Sorry, thank you so much for that talk. That was very thought provoking. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the new the evidence that's emerging now in regards to its keto diets and low carb diets contributing to increased risk of cardiogenic um, events. Uh, so, keto diet and or low carb diet if it increases cardiovascular resist, uh, reduce diseases. Uh, increasing the risk of cardiovascular um, events and increasing the risk of. I don't think so because we're actually starting to understand that cardiovascular diseases could be an inflammatory condition and it's high inflammation, high sugar load, lots of other uh, inflammation like stress, less of lack of sleep and uh, high carbohydrate, refined carbohydrates, sugar actually drives inflammation and those things increases your small dense LDL. And those things can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease rather than the keto low carb diet. So no, I don't think low carb keto increases your risk of cardiovascular risk. Yeah, I suppose I just, um, uh, Vic, if you have those studies, I'd be interested to take a look at them. Um, It'd be interesting to see what they're reporting or what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do have links to studies. I can dig them up and... Um... Oh, no, I mean to Vic. I think she was saying yeah, she sure. heard a study about ketogenic cardiovascular events. So, I, I mean, I'll check it out. Sure, I'll have a look and um, send it through, but they're quite emerging cool. now in terms of new research. I have a bunch of questions, so I'll just wait for everyone else. So. Sure. 
Hi, um, thanks so much for the talk. I was just wondering, um, I'm like an athlete myself and have done a few studies on low carbohydrate diet. Um, a lot of them was qualitative, but I just found it was complete, like this is me personally, this is N equals one, obviously, but I couldn't train. My mood was awful. I had no energy. Um, like, it was just the worst time of my life and maybe that's because I was so used to um, training on carbohydrates and, and things like that but I'm just wondering whether there are certain populations that don't you know maybe it isn't the best diet for. Sure so if you're young and healthy you're probably not at a metabolic risk and you probably the carbs are okay for you and um so eating carbs is probably not much harm and you can metabolize it because you're young and healthy and athletic. But you can still benefit from low carb, but it takes a bit of time to be fat adapted. So if you just train once or twice with low carb diet, it uh, doesn't mean anything. So you've got to persist with it. It can take, it can range from a week to three months to be fat adapted. So you've got to switch, you've got to teach your body to switch to being fat adapted, to burn your body fat rather than burn carbs. And during this process, you will feel more tired. You will feel very, not as much energy and you actually need extra, extra salt. So salt is the key, but you need to give your body time and you need to be very slow and not push yourself. And it might take up to three months to be fat adapted and when you become fat adapted you have endless endless energy you tap into your fat stores you don't need to burn glycogen you don't need to you don't run into the wall as the athletes would say you don't have to carb load and uh, you can have lots of endurance so i would say if you are keen to try athletic performance you should keep persisting with it for more than a month or even up to three months to reap the benefits okay thanks that's really interesting thank you um i also have a question um i was wondering what's the difference between keto and low carb diet and whether you like eat any carbohydrates at all because i know it's a bit different with keto and low carb and what do you think about gluten because gluten is also raising insulin a lot and very inflammatory so yes i was just thinking, yeah because so, i've been low carb for a long time fantastic but i'm trying to be gluten free anyway yeah that's my question sure so it's mainly the number of grams of carbohydrates that's defined so keto is defined as less than 20 gram of carbs a day and low carb is defined as less than 50 gram of carbs a day. So it, you will reap benefits with ETA. So if you're um, stricter with keto, you burn ketones and you actually um, can lose weight faster if that's what you want. If you're a diabetic, you can reverse diabetes quicker. But uh, low carb is good as well. Um, if you want to lo lose weight, low carb will benefit you, you will lose weight, but it could be slower than keto. And uh, if you are diabetic, you will benefit as well. Um, uh, a lot of low carbers actually stay away from gluten. We all know that gluten is highly inflammatory. So gluten includes wheat, rye, oats, and barley. Gluten is highly inflammatory. And um, some there are some uh, links of gluten to autoimmune diseases. They are the lectins. And um, some studies have shown that, or some books or some people have shown gluten can be linked to autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, and even Parkinson's disease. So avoiding gluten is certainly, I think it's a very good idea, even if you don't have celiac disease. So I don't eat much gluten at all. I do every now and then have a bit of a treat. And sometimes if I go out to restaurants, I don't worry too much. I think the trick is to um, be good the majority of the time. And sometimes if you go out, you just have to be relaxed because you have to live life. Um, but um, I do eat some carbs. Like tonight I had a little bit of rice and uh, I eat some sweet potatoes, 
because concentrating on real food, healthy carbohydrates is the key. I eat some berries, uh, blueberries, strawberries, and uh, those are healthy carbs, and I think that's fine. So yes, I do eat carbs. Okay, thank you. And I was wondering if you, so you don't eat sugar at all as well, processed sugar, is that correct? Correct, yeah, try to avoid it as much as possible. Yeah. If there aren't any other questions, I've got a couple, but I thought I'd let other people go first. Um, super interesting talk. Thank you so much for, for doing that, Dr. Charlton. Um, I wrote some notes during so I could remember what I wanted to ask. I, uh, the first one is about um, your point in salt, uh, about salt is well taken. I remember being pretty frustrated by our medical degree when they were talking about salt. My reading of the literature was more that you can get a modest improvement, say four millimetres mercury from reducing salt, but yeah. I couldn't see any association with outcomes. I wondered if you think that it doesn't reduce blood pressure at all or that the association is sort of uh, incorrect. I think it does reduce like a, yeah, four or five millimetres mm -hmm. mercury. Yeah, mercury. Um, so just a tiny bit. Yeah, and it makes food taste terrible. So presumably it makes you more likely to go processed. So Absolutely, yes. So if yeah. you cut out processed foods, you've actually cut out lots of salt. Yeah. And then you can add salt to your real food and that makes food more tasty. Totally. Um, the other question was about the meat and cancer. When I took a look at it, I'm not, I, your point is well taken about healthy user bias, right? We've got healthy people yeah, in one cohort and, and non-healthy people in the other and it skews the results. I, I'm not, I, I, how confident are you that there is an association? Because I, I feel like personally, I'm at the point where I'm not sure because um, I can't, I haven't seen much evidence to the contrary. I just want to get your opinion about it. There is a, there's another doctor who's done a talk on meat and cancer risk, and he's looked at all the risk ratios and most of the risk ratios are just a tiny bit, tiny bit increased risk. Right. But those studies aren't looking at the healthy population. They're looking at the general population who eat meat and who doesn't eat meat. Yep. So they eat a standard diet and compared it to a non-eating group of people. I suppose to follow up on that, do you think like meat's a very broad term? Do you think, I know a lot of people will say red meat is an increased risk, however slight, and then chicken seems to be okay do you have a position on that or do you think they're all uh benign i think they're all benign <laughs> cool this is the ancestral diet we used to eat meat so back in the paleo days we eat the red meat we eat the white meat and that's all we eat and we didn't have much cancer yeah and now we're eating grains and processed foods and that's where the cancer is all right, I've just got two more questions and hopefully they'll be quick. Sure. Um, so the LDL subfraction, I found that fascinating because yeah. I've been reading, uh, you know, when you're talking about unlearning cholesterol, my God, when I was, I, I knew a lot of it before I came into medical school, but it was very frustrating listening to them lecture me about cholesterol. Um, there, I, a side mentioned there's a, Peter Atia is like this uh, longevity doctor out of America. He did an eight hour podcast uh, with a lipidologist in America. Yeah. And uh, that was, if you want to hear about it, it's very interesting. Absolutely. Anyway, yeah, oh, yeah. So question is, you said it's $180. That's very prohibitive. And it makes mm. me think about social determinants of health yes. and how poor people essentially can't afford to get uh, access to things that are required. Yep. Uh, is there any push for putting that into the schedule? I remember being fairly frustrated. Like if you just have LDL, it seems fairly useless to me. Like I would Absolutely. at least want an LDLP, LDLC. So um is it is there any movement from doctors trying to get that funded or do we most need doctors studies? don't know much about ldl subfractions as yet yeah yeah so no there's no movement right now <laughs> <laughs> cool. we're moving doctors to promote low carb <laughs> yeah <So. laughs> um last question is 
religion of diets, uh, which is essentially, um, you know, I'm a, I, I see a lot of good evidence for low carb, but I could even put low carb with it. I, I find that there are so many people with these either vegans the best or carnivores the best or mm. keto is the best. You know, what's your yeah. position on this? It seems like people get like actually offended yes. when you try and talk about some of these, some of the evidence. Even if, you know, the reality is I don't really care. Whatever's best is what I'll go with. It may not even be what I'll eat because, you know, we're all flawed people. But, yeah, yeah what do you think about the religion of diet? Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a religion. So it's a war. It's a vegan war against the carnival war. Um, the vegan can be quite dangerous. So the, I, I think the human population is um, we are evolved to eat meat. So if you look at Dr. Pran Yoga Nathan, he's a gastroenterologist in Sydney. He actually did a talk and you can find it on Low Carb Down Under YouTube. So Low Carb Down Under YouTube has got Dr. Pran Yoga Nathan. The human- How do I spell that? Uh, Pran, P-R-A-N. Yep. That's his first name. Yoga Nathan, Y-O-G-A-N-A-T-H-A-N. So he actually looked at the human gut compared to dog guts and horse guts. And our bowel is actually evolved to eat meat as in animal food. Um, compared to the cows have, they, their gut is designed to eat grass and plants. So the, the perfect nutrient for us is animal products. So quite often, um, when you are vegan, you actually don't, you, you can't absorb enough nutrients. You can't absorb B12 and there's lacking in iron. And quite often it's uh, um, uh, processed foods and high carbs and they actually suffer from metabolic conditions. So I think we really should be looking at how we, how the, the human is designed to eat rather than religious ideations, because then there's um, the vegan, they worry about animal rights and then they don't want to kill anybody. But if- Climate change, obviously exactly, another yeah, issue. Uh, that's right. But if you're plant, if you're um, farming, you have to kill because you've got pesticides, you've got to kill the insects, you've got to kill the bugs, and you're actually doing monocrop it's actually worse for the environment because you're only growing one crop. Whereas if you're farming cows and animals, the cow produce cow poo, and that actually is the fertilizer to help the grass grow. And that's actually the natural cycle of how life evolves. There, sorry, I just wanted to say there is absolutely truth to that. But like my, my concern when you're talking about monocrop versus um, agriculture being like cow production, you're essentially clearing an enormous amount of land. We've already done so to create space for meat production. So in terms of the argument that you know, eating vegetarian, I'm a little zealous about this too, eating vegetarian or vegan is worse than eating meat because of um, growing monocrops. It's, it's, I don't think that that's a very fair thing to say. That's just me. <laughs> sure. Um... I actually have a farm in country Victoria and um, the cows is actually, uh, they're part of the ecosystem. We haven't particularly cleared the land for the cows. The cows are living on the farm and it's their natural environment and they're helping us mow the lawn and we don't have to mow the lawn. So that's actually part of the ecosystem. Um, that's true. but. Sorry, again, like my partner grew up on a, a dairy farm and yeah, you know, they are a part of an ecosystem, but that's not a true ecosystem. It's one that's created for agriculture, which is based on clearance of native Australian bush and land. And I, I do see that the point of agriculture being required for, well, a modern civilization, and I'm not anti-eating meat specifically. I think the quantities that we eat are absurd. But that's another story. Um, but it's more that the argument that our meat production avoids monocrop I, I don't i mean the grass is the monocrop 
you know that's the, that's the problem that i see i think i think i might Sorry, that's just me. i might just cut it there in that realistically i think it's possible to agree to disagree and i and take climate as a separate issue i i mean personally i i i'm fairly convinced it's, it's not great for the environment but the in terms of the t the discussion is nutrition so um then the discussion is low carb and and how how can we improve type 2 diabetes which is basically one of the biggest killers in the world so i think realistically i don't know if you how you feel dr child and obviously you have your right of reply but it's Absolutely. probably outside the scope uh, of the chat anyway on my book list there's a book called the sacred cow the sacred cow has lots of arguments on um pro animal eating rather than vegan so you, you can have a look at that book cool too easy um are we are we does anyone have any more questions otherwise we might leave it there you're most welcome to email me you can um send direct message to me and ask me questions i'm very keen for students to come and approach me and my point is just to keep learning and read more books and follow these people that I have followed and I have learned so much and I want students to keep learning as well and just through listening to podcasts through my um, when I go running or when I go driving you can listen to all these podcasts and I think it's a great way for GPs and students to keep learning that's my whole point. Dr. Dr. Charlton maybe just a quick question um, uh, I practice regionally. So is that low carb diet, is it available sort of, uh, statewide? Can I refer to, obviously you're educated and you can educate your own patient about the diet, but can we refer to a dietitian who, um, is, is it widely, uh, educated no. in, 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 in dietitians? Is, is that, is that? No, true? no, it's not widely educated in dietitian. The traditional dietary course is actually not low carb it's actually the standard australian diet and they follow the food pyramid and because they are traditionally um the seventh day adventist church has um religious ideations and they actually set up the dietitian school traditionally so the dietitians actually follow a carb diet high carb diet and so very hard to get a dietitian that will promote low carb. But through my connections, I've actually just got a low carb dietitian coming into my clinic to promote and educate diabetics on low carb nutrition. And um, so you can actually go to Belinda Fetke's YouTube and it will be on my list of resources. And she actually talked, talks about the religious ideations of how um, we actually become the Seven Day Adventist. Kellogg's has promoted high carb diet, but um, then the dietitians have learned that. So no, it's not very available for dietitian to promote low carb. And I, the same as doctors, most doctors would not promote low carb. They we haven't been taught about low carb nutrition, and I've only just learned this in the last two years through my own research. Thank you. Thank you for the information and thanks for your time. Thank you. Zaid, I'd probably say you could always uh, look her up on the socials and uh, refer directly to Dr. Charlton. I guess if you were a GP, you wouldn't want to refer to another GP, but maybe you could, I don't know, join Low Carb Melbourne and you could become a Low Carb GP yourself. <laughs> yeah, so in Low Carb Down Under, there's actually a list of practitioners that are low carb friendly. So if you go to Low Carb Down Under website, there's um, Australia-wide list of doctors that you can find. Um, there's quite a few of us that you can organize um, consultations with or refer patients to, like Dr. Lucy Burns, she's fantastic, Dr. Mary Barson. So there's uh, quite a few GPs that are low carb friendly. And when I, um, I actually, a couple of days ago, I put a HbA1c of a diabetic patient, 34 year old obese, diabetic patient. I put it on GP Down Under, which is just a normal GP Facebook group. And there's actually lots of GPs that are supportive of low carb diet. So I think the movement is changing and a lot of GPs are realizing that this is what we should promote 
um, rather than a low fat diet. But the cardiologist is still a bit of a problem and they think all the fat will clot all the arteries, including saturated fat and animal food. And they should, you should eat less animal food because otherwise you have high cholesterol and clot art all the arteries. They didn't look at the LDL uh, subtypes on the Framingham study, but I guess that's another uh, question for another time. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Oh. I uh, realize you probably answered a bunch of questions already, um, but I've, I showed up a bit late because I was at work. Um, so if you've covered this already, that's okay. Oh. I'll just leave it. But, Sorry. Um, is yeah, there, go ahead. A lot, okay. lot of um, discussion around, well, in what I've seen around uh, plant-based diets for balancing omega-3 fatty acids with omega-6s and how the uh, an imbalance in them can cause uh, pretty substantial inflammation. Yeah, yeah. How do you approach that for people yes. that are trying to uh, That's right. within like a plant-based diet, for example, rather than having meat? So yes, I agree. So we talk about that too in the low carb world. The healthy omega-3 is actually in a lot of animal food and salmon and healthy fishes. The unhealthy omega-6 is in the seed oils and the vegetable oils and the processed foods. So what we should do is reduce the seed oils, vegetable oils, canola oils, and increase the good healthy omega-3s in the fish and the meat. And we should be, that's how we should be balancing the omega-3 and omega-6 ratios. Okay, and do you, is this something that you test for? I'm a bit no, I haven't. I couldn't. Don't know how to test for that yet. No. Okay. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Maybe in the future. <laughs> but we talk about it in low carb Melbourne a lot, and even almond milk, almond flour that can be high in omega six as well. So the vegans and the um, people, the, there's a lot of people think almond milk is fantastic, but that's actually quite highly inflammatory in in omega six as well. All right, um, we've gone for an hour and 15, so we probably shouldn't chew up any more of your time, Dr. Charlton. Oh, good. That's um, but I just want to say once again, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. And yeah, I think we all agree nutrition education is substantially lacking in medicine, which is pretty crazy given it's such a big part of our lives. Yeah. So um, I really, really appreciate the time you've taken. Thank you. So I encourage all the students who have an interest in learning about nutrition, just look at, what, read books, your podcasts, YouTubes, follow the people, and um, that's the way to go. Amazing, amazing. Um, also, I sent you a, I sent a gift to One Turner Mall. Hopefully it comes, but I, I sent a book over that I hope you like. Oh, um, wow. That was one of the ones that inspired me to get interested in longevity, generally speaking, but they have a good chapter on fasting that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay, All right. I hope everyone don't mind if I post this video on YouTube. No problem at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for your time. Thanks.